Happy World Ocean Day, everyone, and welcome to Episode 4 of Plasticast, the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics podcast. I'm your host, John Dickens. I'm a marine resource management grad student at Oregon State University. I study the impact of microplastics and tire particles on marine and estuarine animal behavior and physiology. Plasticast is an episodic series featuring scientists, legislators, and all interested stakeholders on the latest in plastic pollution research and policy. As we continue learning about microplastics and their environment on and their impact on the environment, I want you to draw attention on why many of us do microplastic research. The ocean. It is often a connection to the fish, sharks, reptiles, invertebrates, otters, kelp, corals, and countless other creatures inhabiting the world's oceans that inspire people to do microplastic research. Joining us today is scientist Dr. Sean Larson, Curator of Conservation Research at the Seattle Aquarium. Sean has extensive research experience with sea otter ecology. Thank you for joining us, Sean, and happy World Oceans Day. Happy World Oceans Day, everybody. I like that mask, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, sea otters are my thing, so I'll take this off. Since I'm um, in a safe space, I'm in the lab at the Seattle Aquarium, um, where we do water quality testing, microplastics testing, uh, endocrinology and genetic analysis, all in this one little space. So could you briefly discuss your role at the aquarium and how the Seattle Aquarium became interested in microplastics research? Yeah, so I am the curator of conservation research here at the Seattle Aquarium. Um, I started our research program here 25 years ago. Um, at that time, we were exclusively studying sea otter uh, reproduction and genetics um, because at that time, we we're actually breeding the sea otters um, quite successfully. The Seattle Aquarium is the first aquarium in the world to successfully breed sea otters. And when we say successful, we mean um, birth to adulthood, about two to three years old. At any rate, um, as the years went by, uh, we started adding uh, more research projects um, to our portfolio, expanding out from sea otters to do uh, six gill shark movement patterns, genetics um, and ecology, and then adding in rockfish um, diversity and abundance over time here in the Salish Sea. And then um, a little bit after that, we um, actually uh, added eight sites in Hawaii where we were looking at uh, coral reef health and uh, reef fish diversity and abundance over time in marine protected areas and areas that were open to all types of fishing. So it was um, about five, six years ago um, that we started partnering with um, the University of Washington in Tacoma, uh, Julie Mazura, who um, caught my eye because she was one of the first researchers to start monitoring microplastics in Puget Sound. And it caught my eye because I'd always been interested in marine debris, but didn't know uh, what role the aquarium could play in that uh, research. And uh, initially, what we decided to do is to host some of Julie's students to start a monitoring program here at the Seattle Aquarium. And our first question was, since we um, are centered right in the heart of downtown Seattle on the waterfront, we're literally in the middle of the city, but we are on the water. Our first question was, uh, what are the levels of anthropogenic marine debris um, right underneath our aquarium? And you might say, well, you know, you're on, you're in a city, you know, there's going to be runoff from the roads, there's going to be runoff or outflow from the sewer systems, et cetera, and the nearby rivers. But why would you be interested in that? Well, uh, most of our exhibits here are temperate uh, local water exhibits. And we are fortunate in that uh, we actually draw all of our water that feeds all our, exhib our exhibitry from right underneath our pier, which is right there in the middle of Elliott Bay. Um, and it's a midwater um, sample. So we're drawing about 2,500 gallons per minute into our aquarium to feed all of our exhibits, our fish, our marine mammals, our seabirds, our invertebrates. We even use that water, but heat it up and buffer it a little bit for our tropical exhibits. Um, so we bring that raw salt water into the aquarium and then we also filter it um, with sand filters that are um, may filter down to five to 10 microns. But our initial question was, first of all, how much marine debris is coming into the aquarium and then how much are our filters able to remove? 
And so we started working with students, um, like I said, at uh, UW Tacoma, and they would do some sampling here at the aquarium and then, and then go back to UW Tacoma and process these samples because we didn't have our own microplastics lab here at the aquarium. So um, the students came and went, we got some data and, and things with, uh, were shifting with the methodology and the microplastics um, discipline. And it was uh, late 2018, early 19 that we decided to, that we wanted to do all that monitoring here at the aquarium. So we actually um, set up our own microplastics monitoring lab with our own clean fume hood and our own microscope and a way to quantify and qualify the marine debris that's coming into our aquarium. Uh, having said that, um, we, we still can only say that we are measuring microfibers because um, we can only visualize the, the marine debris that's coming in um, by processing it and um, filtering it onto a one micron pour filter paper and then looking at it under a high powered microscope that we can then take pictures of and measure these microfibers. But the next step is to really determine what they're made out of. Because a lot of the debris we see in our samples, um, it could be organic or it, could, it doesn't necessarily have to be made out of plastic. So the next step there is to partner with uh, more labs that have um, the next level of spectrophotometry or the FTIR, the Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrophotometry so that will then tell us what those fibers are made of. That is a big word. <laughs> we call it FTIR. Um, and we are partnering with uh, Oregon State University, Dr. Susan Brander's lab, to um, look at some of our microfibers that we've isolated from our incoming water, as well as ocean-wise up in Vancouver, BC. So you mentioned you found a large amount of microfibers coming into the aquarium. So the question that I have and that probably a lot of other people have is, is there any indication that these microfibers is affecting sea otters or fish or any other life around the aquarium? Yes, so um, as I mentioned, we bring in 2,500 gallons a minute, but we're only sampling 100 liters of water um, in our incoming salt water and then the post filtration. So in those 100 liters of water, pre-filtration, we're seeing about 200 microfibers. And then post filtration, we're seeing on average about 80 to 100. So our filters are able to reduce that microfiber load by half, which is great, but there's still microfibers in the exhibits and the fish are still exposed to it. And then the otters are exposed to it, not only in the water that they're swimming in, but also in the food that they eat. So um, we feed them, you know, restaurant quality, human grade seafood, um, clams and crabs and mussels and oysters but uh, they have microfibers in them too. And so we're sponsoring a graduate student at Dr. Brander's lab, uh, Jennifer Van Brocklin. And she is looking at the levels of microfibers that our sea otters are eating. And then is looking at how much is in the sea otters poop. Sea otters eat a lot, up to 25% of their body weight every day just to stay warm because they're the only marine mammal that doesn't have a blubber layer to stay warm. So they have this incredibly thick fur to stay warm. They're basically floating around in a little dry suit. Their skin never gets wet, but they're still losing heat to the environment. So they have to eat a lot. So they poop a lot. So we here at the aquarium collect that poop, give it to Jennifer, and she's trying to figure out how much the sea otters are eating, um, looking at their food, and then how much they are getting rid of. And um, we're just not at the stage where we know um, how these microfibers might be affecting the sea otters' health. Um, or the fish for that matter, but there are some people that are working on this, looking at the levels of microfibers in larval fish and how that might affect their development. Um, this is a very new discipline, the microplastics and nanoplastics um, monitoring and research. Um, so we're just, we don't have those answers quite yet. We suspect that it must be affecting them somehow, but we don't know at what level. We're doing research on um, the incoming salt water that feeds the whole aquarium just to see what our animals are exposed to, plus to see the, the breadth and scope of the problem on an urban waterway like Elliott Bay in, you know, right next to downtown Seattle. So that's the first monitoring question that we started doing. But then, um, of course, the impact of what's happening with the otters, et cetera. So we started supporting um, 
Jennifer, the graduate students work with that, plus we have samples of the sea otters and their food. Um, but we're also interested in looking at environmental samples um, at the other research uh, sites that we, for example, the rockfish survey sites throughout the Salish Sea where we look at rockfish diversity abundance. We also see um, sea stars appear and disappear and then the kelp disappear and then the urchin barrens coming up. And so we wanted to look at what are the environmental parameters around that. And so one of the parameters that we're looking at in these Salish Sea research sites um, is the microplastics. So we'll take a, a grab sample at our, our fish survey sites, fill it up with water, and we'll actually process that here in our clean fume hood, um, and then look at the level of microfiber and microplastics debris in that water. And then as well as other um, environmental parameters such as nutrients, bacteria, um, dissolved oxygen, temperature, et cetera, that may inform us when we see these significant shifts in fish and invertebrates, is there something in the water that is going to clue us into that? Um, that's a, a recent uh, addition to our rockfish survey sites that we've been doing. At the same time, we've been uh, monitoring uh, Hawaii reef systems for 12 years now, eight different sites in fish replenishment areas. They're um, uh, MPAs and then in areas where all fishing is allowed. Um, and we have seen shifts in fish diversity and abundance on those sites. We also have seen coral bleaching at those sites in the 2015-2016 warm water event that occurred off of Hawaii. Um, and we've been working with our partners at University of Hawaii Hilo that have been for many years monitoring the water quality around those systems, but they've been doing it at the surface. So again, since we're down there taking video, um, looking at fish and corals, we bring a, a, a sample bottle down. One is just for microplastics and then the other is for the other nutrients that we're looking at. Um, we initially did work um, on the surface in Hawaii to look at um, a larger sample size, 100 liters. And since it was at the surface and there was wave action, we found that um, all of the microfibers we're looking at were big tangle groups. and It was really hard to tease them apart and determine what they're actually made out of. So we've scaled back and gone to this benthic uh, mid or to mid water column um, sampling of the micro uh, fibers and microplastics. And there's some research that's recently been done at the University of Washington um, looking at coral reefs and uh, their ingestion of microplastics and how that actually affects their ability to resist bleaching. Um, so what they found is um, the corals that ingest more microplastics actually are less resilient to the bleaching events. And it, it could be nutritional because when they're, when those little coral polyps are eating these things that aren't food, you know, the microfibers, microplastics, and that's um, taking up space um, that would otherwise be plankton. So we don't really know that, but um, there's more work that needs to be done about um, microplastics and its effects on coral reef health. Thank you, Sean. Se Seattle has been a leader in successfully reducing disposable plastic pollution with certain successful and I think clever initiatives such as hashtag strawless in Seattle and hashtag stop sucking. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sean, what's, what is, in your opinion, what's one thing that I can do as a citizen to, you know, join Seattle? in, in uh, reducing my disposable plastic uh, footprint? Well, the biggest thing is to not consume it in the first place um, because um, I'm sh uh, in recent news, um, you know, we've, we've always tried to reduce, reuse, and recycle, but we, it's become apparent recently that recycling plastic, especially single-use plastic, isn't really as effective as we thought it was um, when China stopped taking our plastic debris, which they don't have to. They don't have to be, you know, the garbage dump of the world for plastic, um, single-use plastics. But at any rate, that's where a lot of our um, recycled plastics were going. And um, it seems that it's more expensive to recycle single-use plastic water bottle than to make a new one. So there's not that economic incentive. So what most people should do is really just try and purchase things that is not in plastic packaging. 
And if and that's really hard to do because if you go to any grocery store, I don't care where it is, there's everything's in a plastic container, it seems. So um, trying to reduce our consumption of single-use plastics is a challenge, but if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Um, and um, you know, with all the new plastic bag bans and the um, takeout food uh, plastic container bans that are happening throughout the country, um, we're definitely reusing our um, single-use plastics, but there's still plenty that could be done. So um, once it gets out from the environment, it's really hard to clean up, you know, especially these, these micro particles. Uh, we're, you know, we're doing our best just to try and um, understand the scope of the problem, but then the next step is how do you clean it up? And I think that the best thing to do is just to keep it out of our waste stream in the first place. <laughs> thank you for that insight, Sean, and thanks for joining us today. And thank you, listeners, for catching the fourth episode of Plasticast, the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics podcast. Tune in for bi-weekly episodes as we explore the world of plastic pollution research and policy. And find us on Twitter at Pacific Northwest Pla Microplastic. That's at PNW Microplastic. I'm your host, John Dickens. Have a great week and a happy World Ocean Day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>